Paula, signal is good. Okay, we are live. Thank you for staying with us for 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 all the afternoon. Um, it is my pleasure now to introduce you our second keynote speaker, and it's the last event for for tonight before we. Uh, hopefully have a, night, a nice networking dinner upstairs. Um, we thought who would best introduce um, all the deliberations uh, ESFRI was doing over the past decades. And uh, of course we had to ask the chair of the ESFRI forum. I'm very happy that Jan Huschak uh, agreed to come and uh, present what the S3 Forum, of course, was doing and what his personal ideas uh, in that respect are. Um, I think everyone knows you. There is, there is, there is, there is no no need to introduce you other than the current S3 Chair. You are in representing your country in that forum for for a very very long time. Um, you are an expert in uh, uh, in the field, and we are looking very much forward to your to your presentation. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Marco. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I feel a little bit uneasy to stay here in front of a group which I consider experts in the field and uh, being being a quantum. I feel also a little bit handicapped to speak about, about a topic where I have a little understanding of. Uh, but anyhow, uh, S3 as such has over the last years developed some thoughts and I will try to, to bring it over to you. Uh, I have the advantage that uh, Dominic in the morning made a very nice introduction to the topic and as he is representing the commission and as free, so to say, is a member state driven animal, uh, the, the, the views might be uh, complementary and you will eventually see uh, where there is huge resonance and where there are still some differences. Uh, eventually, it is important for the understanding of the logics of my very simple-minded presentation uh, to, to bring you closer and remind you what S3 is about. Because S3 is a very special animal, as said. S3 uh, has been established already quite long time ago, and it shall serve several purposes, but mainly provide uh, policy advice to the Council of Ministers, so very high level, but very general. The advantage turns immediately into the, a disadvantage, and you will see that as a red tape rolling over through all my presentations. Uh, the interesting thing of S3 is its success. And S3 is really a successful undertaking, and it is one of the few examples where a rather straight way forward can make waves and can create huge impact. This is partially, to my simplified understanding, given by the fact that the composition of S3 is very unique. We bring together delegations from member states and associated countries, and the composition of those delegations is very mixed. So we are able to have very merit-based discussions on a huge variety of topics, having different viewpoints and positions even within one delegation, but still the delegation speaking with one voice, and the forum as such is trying to develop a common understanding without even having a voting procedure. And this is particularly interesting if you are friends or enemies or at least understand the comitology issues. And uh, this 
ability of, of S3 to develop common understanding forces us to go quite often, often in depth to problems which by standard procedures would have been difficulties to be solved or even discussed because usually the delegations would have to defend then their national positions and uh, sometimes the dialogue would be quite, quite tedious. The next interesting thing is that despite the fact that we over the years succeeded to coordinate, align member states' investment in the order of several tens of billions of euros, we are running off no budget. This is also something which in my understanding gives us the freedom to speak about problems based on their merits. Of course, money is important and finally somebody has to pay the bill and quite often these are the same people sitting around the table in, in S3. But the primary discussion is problem oriented and we are really facing a pragmatic way to solutions. S3 is also not a commission service. And this is particularly important after the talk of Dominic today because the commission is one of our members. One of the members of S3 is the European Commission. And this allows us to freely exchange on a very informal basis policies, assets, understandings, and influence in a very informal way uh, discussions which are then led in a more formalized way at the level of the member states with the commission or between themselves. S3 is a communication platform. But we have, and Dominic indicated that already in the morning, we have at least one very visible output. And this is the S3 roadmaps. The S3 roadmaps started and you see also the faces of all the former S3 chairs, started as an opportunity list. The member states, together with the scientists, came together on the demand of the ministers and have been discussing which research infrastructures, which investments, which sciences would be favorable to be done at the level of co cooperating member states in a variable geometry. So we are inclusive, but we are not pushing anybody. And we created the first roadmap under John Woods. Immediately after that, this roadmap has had huge impact. And many member states started in inspiration of this roadmap, create their own national processes. I'm sorry, this was not intended. Uh, started to create uh, internal processes and it became very apparent that we have to go through, through updates and we did that in 2008 and 2010. Dominic indicated the implications this roadmap process had to our understanding of the management of research infrastructures and indeed there is a, a continuous development also in this direction. But moreover, I mean, very soon this roadmap became by far more than a simple list of possible projects and installations. And it gained a very strategic dimension already in the very early stages. Why I like this picture is that it shows in principle two periods. In the orange period, we have been in our thinking and discussions dominated by the science case. And the first three roadmaps really focused on best services to best European science. 
Then there is this dashed line uh, which makes or indicates a kind of break and after the line you see then this blue period coming up. And before I go to the details, one shall remember that many things happened around 2008. We've been suffering from an economic crisis in 2009. And this came with an implication. And the ministers, as our uh, mind masters, just, just came with a request and said, hey, are you not able to, to prioritize? Uh, we, we, are, we, are, we are facing uh, budget cuts. Our, our uh, ability to invest into these huge research facilities is, is going down. Can, can you give us a more concrete advice? And we, we spent some time with the help of the European Investment Bank and, and other, other stakeholders to, to elaborate a little bit more on our processes. And uh, there was really a, a, a change in, in perception, in attitude, and in directionality of the roadmap. And we, we decided to change the color in order to make it more clear. So the roadmap in 2016 had several changes. First of all, we have pretty much elaborated the concept of life cycle. And this, this brought an additional dynamics to the entire policy discussion and uh, almost the rest of my talk will be devoted to the life cycle. We also recognized that implementation readiness is a very important indicator for the quality of research infrastructures. So that it's not enough to consider only the scientific case, but we, we also started to develop our methodology towards implementation. And this is particularly important because many of the issues you have been discussing earlier today are somehow fixed in our implementation methodology as indicators or at least as points to be considered in the evaluation process. We also discovered that even the res research infrastructures, which are already successfully implemented, still deserve the attention of policymakers, but mainly politicians. And we introduced the concept of landmarks as infrastructures which are uh, delivering science. The, the roadmap as such turned more and more to a very strategic report which had a very extensive landscape analysis and developed a lot of thoughts along different, different policies including the HR policy or, or other strategic things, and we continue in the process. I told already several, I will be shorter on other slides. Uh, I told already to several of you that we are now in the middle of the future of S3 discussion, where we are thinking how we can even more effectively provide or, and fulfill our strategic role how we can better serve the purpose, how we can better serve the infrastructures, how we can better serve the, the entire research infrastructure system aside of the, of the now, now it's gone, okay, aside of the, of the S3 research infrastructures and how we can uh, utilize the, the, the recognitions we have got in order to provide policy advice to our ministers. So uh, in course of our thinking, and Dominic made also reference to that, there were two Ramiri projects which were pretty much in the direction you are thinking about. I'm quite sure that you have been building on, on these findings. Dominic also made the indication that there is a quite extensive and very readable handbook uh, resulting from that. Uh, I just would proudly say that both projects were led by our former chairs. And very importantly, uh, there was a 
very effective instrument developed within this project, and this is a mutual learning exercise, exchange of experiences. This was proven to be very powerful, uh, where the S3 delegations came together with S3 infrastructures and in mutual exchange develop uh, ways forward how to solve strategically very important problems which then promoted also back to national levels and materialized in some funding. Uh, this is just to, to remember you that S3 is not producing as a formal output only roadmaps, but we are putting forward a lot of advices. We, we are doing a lot of, lot of policy reports. Uh, we, we are putting forward reports from our exchange of experience workshops, and we have recently established a new series, the so-called S3 Scripta, where we uh, publish advices which uh, deserve broader, broader political and policy attention. And uh, one of them have been, or two of them have been mentioned earlier, earlier today. So uh, long-term sustainability uh, was introduced today already by, by several speakers. Uh, the formal request to S3 was formulated in the forum of, of ministers in the Competitiveness Council in 2016. The wording you have here, uh, the Commission and Dominic has presented that, started with a, a consultation and an entire process leading to a targeted action plan. S3 has set up an ad hoc working group. I had the hon honor to, to chair it but the result is really a collective endeavor. And this uh, working group came with several recommendations uh, and a subset of uh, 37 sub-recommendations. And many of them, not only the two Marcus mentioned or the one Dominic mentions, are related to the topic of the right brain and therefore I use the next three slides to, to, to recall those, even so you probably have seen them. So, so we, we, we are really, and, and this is something which was uh, not, not uh, often repeated or uh, even questioned here in, in, in these discussions, we are very much aware that the first prerequisite for, for, for sustainability of research infrastructures is scientific excellence. Without that, it doesn't make sense to go any further. And already the second one is, uh, and I use that as, 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 as for, for my today's talk, is really uh, something which has much deeper roots than one could, say, uh, one could think of, and to, to guarantee really that the research infrastructures are very well equipped with people having the right skills. And uh, one small idea I am ho ho hoping to contribute to your discussion is that even this process has some dynamics and eventually one can consider that. We have had some other, other recommendations. One is also relevant for, for, for the discussions here, and uh, this is the management thing and governance thing, and I will, I will show you the uh, sub-recommendations here. Uh, this is only to remember that uh, right people with right skills uh, can be managed and, and actions can be taken at different levels, so all our recommendations go always to the European level, to the national levels, to the research infrastructures themselves, and you can, you can see what we have been thinking that time about, about uh, staff mobility, about, about ma research infrastructure management, research uh, infrastructure uh, training of, of managers, about harmonization, some things about pension schemes and so on. And I will, I will repeat some of these uh, buzzwords later on. 
Uh, at the same level, we have, been, we have been introducing some recommendations when it comes to governance and, and management, and we, we have immediately connected, connected uh, governance and management, which in your words is the political level with, with the operational level of, of the research infrastructures. And furthermore, we also uh, indicated that this is not going, coming free of charge and has some relevance in costing and costing models. So uh, now I want to spend some time on a very important concept which we have introduced already quite some time ago, but we are still not fully utilizing its uh, possibilities. So uh, the life cycle of research infrastructures. In the earlier panel today, you have been speaking about old and new research infrastructures. This is more or less the essence of that what we are thinking about, but we have been doing that in a bit more structured way, and we've been developing a picture which over the time has evolved, so that the reason, recent structure is that we are considering six major phases of the life cycle of research infrastructures, and these phases come with entirely different requirements when it comes to human capacities, when it comes to the composition of the stuff, when it comes to the financial requirements, when it comes to policy domains, when it comes to, to everything. And uh, finally, and I will have someone also a slide on the termination, because the termination does not necessarily mean uh, the termination of the services of the research infrastructure. It may mean other things, and then we are starting to make loops, and this may have, again, very interesting uh, consequences for the dynamics of movement of stuff, for example. Uh, I think I, I, I matched uh, almost uh, the wording which came earlier here, uh, in the discussion, namely, that we consider, and this is really a, uh, let's say, concept which must be digested, we consider research infrastructures as complex and steadily changing environment. And this comes with different role models for different actors. And this may come with a periodicity if we, if we are starting to do the loops of up updates eventually, or may still keep the shape for, let's say, largely distributed research infrastructures where the processes are more coherent. Uh, now, I am I'm even a little bit ashamed about the naivety in which we, we are presenting, presenting this thing. So I would restrict myself to the, to the question mark over there namely the discussion whether a research infrastructure manager shall be more a scientist or more a manager. I mean, in an ideal world, this person shall have a dual career, shall be at the same level scientist and manager. Uh, of course, there is a time issue, there is a development, so one could go into an education system and require new curricula with the problem that eventually an uh, 18 years old student will hardly uh, consider a career as a research infrastructure manager if everything else is rather fuzzy and unclear and the career is not such attractive. So, uh, but eventually, I would even see double doctorates for, 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 for the top level management as a very good way forward. Uh, this has been mainly already uh, discussed here. I, I don't know whether, whether I want to, to, to pick up something, something uh, very particular, apart of, of the last thing 
where we really believe, and it may have also consequences for further discussions, uh, that research infrastructures have to be understood as a global ecosystem. We shall probably even uh, revoke our division into national research infrastructures and pan-European or global inf research infrastructures, because in fact, everything is pretty much interconnected. It's interconnected by science, it's interconnected by policies, it's interconnected by users, and finally, it's interconnected by money. If you put a large investment there, you maybe will need to cut somewhere the, the, the same pot of money. So uh, this idea of a research ecosystem, which goes along with all these clustering initiatives and all, all the other things we observe, uh, is probably a new paradigm which we shall study and understand. Uh, here I am trying to, to, to show you what you already know, that at different stages you need different competencies and eventually you have to train your staff when you proceed through this uh, phase shift. But eventually you have also to exchange people. And if you exchange people then, uh, I mean, <coughs> and you have invested already quite a long, uh, quite a much, quite much money in their, in their training. So, it would be good if we, if we could create a European career path, if, if the people would be mobile, if, if they would have sufficient skills to, to, to change research infrastructures, which are, again, in the proper uh, corresponding phase of, of their life cycle, and so on. And, and this arrow just, just indicates that S3 is, by its uh, assessment of research infrastructure projects, which come to us, uh, to the roadmap, somewhere around the preparatory phase, is using uh, the implementation assessment for putting forward some of the questions, and we are somehow implying that already some pre-existing knowledge in these research infrastructure projects is, and uh, this shall, in principle, also help uh, the, the development of these particular skills. So, so we are asking for a business plan, we, we are asking for, for different kinds of strategies, we are asking for costing models, we are asking for, for many things you know from the operational infrastructures, and we, because we are really thinking in, in terms of very strategic role of S3, picking up the best and most prepared, uh, the best and uh, best prepared research infrastructures in Europe for, ready for implementation and uh, giving, giving uh, ad advice, no, I'm playing here games, uh, giving advice to, to, to our ministers in a proper way of investing quite sizable amounts of money. So the requests are quite, quite sizable and I think you shall also appreciate it because this push clearly indicates that we consider all the issues you, you have included into your training program as pretty relevant. Uh, I don't think this deserves more than reading by you once uh, we, we go further. And, and, and uh, this is the second part of the graph. Contrary to the first part, we have also three phases here but they are clearly distinct. If you have a single-sided, physical, large research infrastructure, like the spallation source in Lund or any other, uh, I don't know, synchrotron-like installation, you need very specific skills in the construction and implementation phase. The scientific concept is a little bit aside, the technology becomes predominant and is complemented by financial skills and, and managerial planning and so on. While in the end of this phase, the science comes again in. 
And in the operational phase, you have a kind of equilibrium, as you have been discussing in the previous two panels, between science and management. And determination is an issue on itself. I have indicated also two, two areas where ESFRI is intervening. Uh, one is just a simple continuation from the previous picture where when you applying for, for a, a position on an ESFRI roadmap, you go through a regular assessment with all the things which I have been mentioning and which you can read in the, in the corresponding documents. But what's new uh, as a consequence of the life cycle is that these landmarks, uh, which were awarded a kind of, of label of quality, which are uh, uh, occupying a very, let's say, prominent position on the S3 roadmap, shall be, according to our considerations, somehow from time to time revisited, and we shall uh, be sure that the advice which we are giving with, with the roadmap and with the list of landmarks is still valid and still satisfies all the quality criteria which uh, were, were there in the beginning. And therefore, we are now very intensely working uh, on a monitoring uh, methodology which is almost complete. Several of you have seen that, have been participating in our uh, stakeholder workshops, have participated in the discussion. Uh, I hope that we will be able to, to, to agree on, on this methodology, including the key performance indicators in the, in the forum next, uh, next month. And then we, we, we will start discussing how to implement the thing. Uh, this eventually was already said, uh, and uh, I, I, I just, uh, in, a, in a way, uh, which is a little bit oversimplified, have also discovered that there is a, a painful competition between research infrastructures, which are usually somewhere close to the public space, being public research institutions, or, or even, even government, uh, government owned and the private sector and this may have some consequences for the stuffing. The transition to the operational phase is also an asset because contrary to the, let's say, initial design phase where the researchers are still being challenged in developing new ideas, new scientific concepts, and working on their glory, so to say, within the entire uh, cultural setup, which is usually around a research institution. Uh, when going to the operational phase, you need very qualified people who are willing to devote their scientific competencies also partially or fully to services to others. And this is a cultural change. And this must be digested. This is not such simple going thing. You want to have highly, highly sophisticated stuff, but they shall provide services to others. I mean, this contradicts a little bit the, the, the idea of, of competition in science, the, the fight for being the first on the discovery. And uh, this has also uh, some consequences. There are also some changes in the management, but uh, these, these changes are minor and can probably eas be easily uh, accommodated, even so that might be my ignorance where the scientist is still coming out. But it's very useful to have a long-term strategy well ahead of this phase transition where one would consider a way forward, one would bring this idea closer to the staff, one would really prepare all, all, the, all the people on, on the changes which are going to happen and would give a cl clear perspective to them. 
uh, yes. This, this is something which I just in principle said, and there are few, few, few words which could be, could be uh, read uh, further. I just would, would underline that it's, it's good to offer also some motivation to the people. I mean, the best motivation probably I, I skip this, this picture, because this ju is just an indication for a more philosophical uh, discussion possible that we, with the termination cycle, could eventually close a loop and, and start the process from the beginning and, and just multiply the problems on, on the way. Uh, but still, this may happen. It happens already now with several infrastructures. And in particular, when it comes to human resources and the consequences uh, this, this have, I mean, we shall be aware that we are again changing the cycle. So we are eventually again changing those scientists who now got familiar with providing services and changing them, hey, bring us a new concept. And, and this may have consequences. So we, we shall think about how to do that in a most efficient way without losing those people. So the users co come in or external advice comes in. And this, again, a bit complicates the processes. It is uh, somehow touched upon in the, in the Ramiri handbook as it is referenced here. So coming to the end, skipping that, you have been discussing it. And quite quite happy that uh, when when putting forward some barriers, which in my very simplified view came to my mind, uh, I, I found some matching with the discussions you have had uh, earlier earlier today. I would really like to underline the salary level. I would like to underline the visibility of research infrastructures as an very important asset and uh, it would help not only uh, to, to, to increase the efficiency of use but it would also help to, 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 to smoothen or, or propagate a clear pa career path for those who would like to be engaged and one shall try to prevent mismatch in expectations. Uh, here also no, nothing new, just, just to, to confirm that in our discussions about the future of ESFRI and about the role ESFRI may play in contributing to the new and newly uh, develop it, developing concept of the European research area, which shall enter a political discussion next year, we are thinking pretty much in line with that what you have been discussing at a much higher level of sophistication. Thank you. <laughs> Almost. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jan, for this very inspiring and also some detailed giving presentation. I'm sure you, uh, you will have a few questions. Um, we will need again the microphone, please. And there is one, two, to start with. Hi, Jan. I would uh, have a lot of uh, questions to you, but I will pick one. And that's for your barrier, your list, if you can go back to the list of the barriers that you mentioned for the couple of slides. Uh, one, one earlier, these ones. Um, when I have been negotiating with the countries about the resources uh, for the research infrastructures, these are the one of the things that are never put on the top of the list. So this is, this is exactly that the, often I'm seeing that our plans for our salary levels are too high. Uh, we have not, uh, we have been, uh, our kind of a plans for our human resource strategies are too ambitious. Uh, we are putting too much of a governance on the research infrastructures and, uh, and then, of course, there's a high uh, interest for to, to increase the visibility. And uh, if we will insert a training program for our funding budgets, that is uh, one of the things that it goes away first. So in a way that I'm really happy that this is now identified, but how we can 
enable the communication for our stakeholders and, and uh, funding agencies to understand that these are key issues for operating a people-related research infrastructure. Uh, okay. I mean, there are obviously two answers, and one is a very simple no, I don't know. On, on the other hand, there are some supporting arguments, and this is, first of all, the speed and dynamics of the development. So you need people who are much more capable to adapt to, to different situations and do that eventually regularly, and, and this comes with cost. The, this cost may uh, include the training, but it essentially also include uh, the, the mind of people. So you're going for a special kind of, of persons who are really willing to undergo several training and, and ed educational processes. This is not uh, something which is acceptable to everybody, and you have to motivate this thing. The other, the other argument one certainly can use is also, and it goes in a pretty much similar way, uh, the, 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 the fast changes in, in uh, science-related areas, but connected to new technologies and techniques, digitalization and things like that, artificial intelligence. I mean, uh, I, I'm sitting also on several other boards and I mean, we are quite often already starting discussing at this, quite for me, because I'm just a simple-minded chemist, uh, close to science fiction level, that at a certain moment for some internal processes in management and research infrastructure, in handling of data or, or of processes, the, the human element is the slowing down element, and that several things can be done more or less automatically. And, and this, again, requires people in the surrounding of this artificial intelligence with even more skills and even more flexibility and capability to understand the problems. And this comes, again, with higher costs. So, uh, and, and you can propagate that to, 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 the, to, the, to the accounting systems where, wherever you wish. I mean, you are going for, for the top people because you are operating a top-level infrastructure. And I mean, you, you are not just wasting the huge investment by saving several hundreds of thousands. Okay, Ed, on the left side here. Thanks for the very nice overview of the, of the S3 program and where things are going. I'm interested in the life cycle, the concept of the life cycle we're going through. Um, I, I just wondered, I mean, the ISRAF would benefit very much from recommendations for the upgrade program and being on the roadmap and stuff like this. I, I, I wondered, because your yellow boxes um, stopped at, at monitoring, do you think S3 will take a role in positively recommending a termination? Or, uh, you know, cause one of the hardest things to do is to say at a, a, a different level that this beamline at the ISRAF is not working, we should change it or stop it. Is that uh. something... You can I like shall be very careful uh, in answering that uh, <laughs> for several reasons. One of them being that S3 has not found yet an agreement on this. Uh, but uh, in my understanding, it comes more or less uh, naturally because we are speaking about, of course, national funding, but at certain levels, this national funding is intrinsically connected to the S3 advice. At several levels, already rather mechanically. So it's go or not go. You know, you are on the list, you are not on the list. Opposite, anyhow. Uh, and, and this means that at the moment, and again, this is not yet agreed at uh, the S3 level, so it's just my personal guess how it will uh, be implemented, and we will spend a fair time in discussing it. But, uh, I mean, monitoring is a light process. It's not an evaluation. It's just following how well the research infrastructure is progressing on the path towards the targets. And these targets are somehow commonly agreed with somebody. 
and eventually the member states will have a sizable role in this monitoring process as well and S3 will just uh, maintain, let's say, the pan-European part or the European added value. But still, uh, the decision after a single monitoring cycle shall not be the same like for an evaluation. It shall be a kind of support to the research infrastructure and therefore we are really thinking in terms of a kind of triangle where the research infrastructure, the national member states and S3 are sitting around a table, literally speaking, and, and discussing things. So it shall be a way how to monitor the progress and how to introduce correctives eventually if they are needed with all the players around the table. So if you fail once, not much happens. If you fail twice, maybe a yellow card. And the, maybe three times, then you will get the red one. But still, this doesn't mean an end of the research infrastructure. And again, it's just my idea of, of a way forward. But as uh, the, 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 the processes back home in the national member states are quite often rather mechanical, and sometimes the ex-ante conditionalities of being or not being on the S3 roadmap have fatal uh, consequences, it may eventually end up in situations where uh, even the monitoring may, may lead to some recommendations in this direction. But it is not meant to be so. We are just saying, hey, you might be a still very valid research infrastructure, but in several parameters, you quite, uh, several times already failed to deliver what was expected to be delivered, and therefore you are not a landmark anymore. A quick comment and a question, John. So the, the comment is so taking inspiration from Canada where I evaluated some infrastructures. They were actually ex expected to track where highly qualified personnel went after they had been at the research infrastructure, which is maybe an interesting thought for the monitoring framework of S3 because it actually shows that there is a value to society by feeding in people into other uh, parts of society, either research or industry. Anyway, the, the question, and I think that's an interesting aspect for us uh, distributed infrastructure, is that our national nodes or national facilities are often in very, very different stages of this life cycle. And so we manage things in the early implementation phase for some of the new ones, while we have others that are in stable operations. And I think the, the sort of synchronization of these national business cases is a major challenge for most distributed organizations. So I don't know if S3 has thought anything around that. Uh, as said, at the level of S3, we are now in the stage where we have a more or less consolidated draft of the monitoring uh, mechanism. We have a list of uh, KPIs. Uh, we hope that we will uh, conclude our, our discussion on these two topics in the December meeting. And then we start exactly in this way, thinking about how we bring it to life, how we implement this, this process. And uh, this will require time because I, but the other uh, colleagues in the forum as well, uh, really prefer quality for speed. And uh, it will be also uh, quite interesting and, and, and uh, let's say, uh, fundamental discussion about how to share share the responsibilities for the monitoring process between uh, the S3 and the other players because still and you know that better than me that uh, vast majority of the funding comes from the member states so uh, this, this is certainly an argument which brings the member states very high into this agenda. Uh, I have not been showing here the, the, the council conclusions on this topic here, uh, but one shall, one shall uh, remember the council is the council of ministers, so it's the council of member states. And the member states agreed that S3 shall elaborate a methodology which might be used at national levels 
and also for other than S3 infrastructures. So there is a kind of willingness to accept things because all the, all the member states at the different levels of, of public and state administration somehow feel that a monitoring process is anyhow necessary. And, and then if we, we can do that uh, at a quasi European level with some, uh, let's say, national uh, adaptations, then it's still a, a better process than if every, every country would that by, 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 by its own. Thank you. Um, still concerning this life cycle <coughs> for infrastructures, um, when, when I look at that, the, um, I always think about the axis that can be time and investment, but I cannot avoid thinking that the operation that is when the infrastructure is fulfilling its mission it's an, in a descending path. So it is awkward to me because I, I relate this cycle with the cycle of a product, that when you reach the highest top, you start thinking to the next level. So, uh, and for me, this makes a lot of sense because of, there is a lot of investment to reach that stage. So why are we coming down? Uh, it's something <laughs> that I don't understand. Yes. Okay, uh, ju just, just to, 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 to make the story a bit more complicated, I would put a lot of emphasis on the, on the uh, first word here, on the complex. Because, of course, you indicated three axes, I could think about six, seven more. And this multidimensionality uh, doesn't make it easier to understand. And if you understand and if you do some pattern recognition or, or, or something like that, then it's... Uh, rather difficult, if not impossible, due to, as I said already twice today, do the statistics of small numbers do some uh, quite, you know, forecast or, or something. But uh, the, 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 the reason why it goes down, and I mean, I am a chemist, but I, I just remember having seen an economic graph of a product development which has a similar shape, but a certain periodicity, is simply that things are going change, uh, that these research infrastructures are a part of an uh, infrastructure system, but a part of a research system, part of an economical system, part of a societal. So there might be various reasons why a research infrastructure does not fulfill the mission for which it was set up in the beginning. It doesn't mean it's obsolete, it doesn't mean it's not useful, it doesn't mean anything. It just says, with this target, okay, we have to rethink the entire story. This might be that the science has developed to another direction. That the perception of, I don't know, nuclear power plants went further down. So uh, there will not be so many infrastructures devoted to this. This might be that, you know, plenty of reasons, including, let's say, uh, fi financial things. It might well be that there are such severe budgetary restrictions that we just have to choose one or two which we close down in order to let the other survive. So, uh, and it's just a symbolism anyhow. There is one more, one more question. Yes. Just one question. Um, I think I, we are I today. To so I can go to we are most discussed about uh, what happens at the managerial level it's about training the infrastructure. I wonder um, how we can uh, uh, improve the capacity of politicians to learn more about how the infrastructure works and what they need in the next futures. Uh, that's, that's a good question and I would like somehow to escape from answering. <laughs> but, uh, no. Uh, first of all, I'm coming from Czech Republic and uh, the Czech language doesn't distinguish between politics and policy. Uh, and this makes my life back home quite difficult because Based on the success and the impact we have been able to demonstrate as S3, 
but this extends to all the research infrastructures uh, which are of a certain dimension or certain functionality, we have uh, gained, let's say, the attention of policymakers. And they are coming to us quite often with very targeted, very specific requests for advice. And we, we are trying to, to, to help to develop this uh, research infrastructure ecosystem, setting it into, into different, even sectorial policies and, and uh, developing argumentations for that. Just, just remember, we have got like two years ago competencies in the field of e-infrastructure, something where we had really to struggle how to touch that. We've been asked to become a hub of funders something which we have not fully accommodated yet. So there are some, some challenges even for ESFRI, but uh, through our collective knowledge and, and the experience we have developed over the almost 20 years, we are a kind of trustable partner and even a reference point for policy makers. How it propagates to the political domain, I don't know, but there is a certain element that if we are just not focusing only on, on a list of research infrastructures, but developing an entire uh, argumentation framework, then I think even the politics can appreciate this because it's a really merit-based advice. And when it comes covered uh, with, with, with the s label, then it's even not so much biased by lobbying and other un unclear activities. So even there, there might be some, some benefits for the research infrastructure. Um, I think the message is clear. We need S3 on board to develop programs for those policy makers. Um, no, I'm joking. <laughs> um, um, I think we are Closing for uh, tonight, um, we will have dinner upstairs. Um, for tomorrow, remember, we are in the Ruben Hall. That's a different entrance. It's when you enter in front of the building on the right side. I think it's entrance B. Yeah, so if, uh, when you leave tonight, if you come down the stairs, if you come down the stairs through the glass doors, you can exit either, either left or right. And we're at that, at the moment, obviously, we're at that end of the building. Tomorrow, you come in the entrances, the other end. Okay. Okay. Um, any other housekeeping for tonight? No. no just enjoy, enjoy just the enjoy the dinner. Thank you very much.